Hi, I'm Adam Porter, or Adam in Wales, and this is my board gaming vlog, and it's that time of year again where I go through my top 10 games of the year and talk a little bit about how the year has gone for me, what I've enjoyed, what I haven't enjoyed so much. Um, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a big, uh, strange, uh, wonderful year for me. I've moved house, hence I've got slightly different surroundings, unfortunately, hence the, the sound on this video isn't as good as it uh, once was. Not that it was ever great on this channel, and I've never yet worked how to use a microphone with an iPhone and all that, and I don't want to spend a fortune on camera equipment. I make no money from these videos, that's not what they're about, and all of that, so I apologise for the sound quality. Um, but I'm in a new room, new games room, in a new house. Uh, I have, you'll, you'll have noticed if you've watched any of my previous videos that I recently got married. Uh, I didn't actually give you any sort of update on how that went, because I talked about all these games in that video that I was going to play at the wedding, or weddings, because I had a German wedding and I had a, uh, a UK wedding, and actually the big hit at those weddings, games got played a lot, and the big hits were Happy Salmon. Happy Salmon went over fantastically uh, because I had a you know a, a, a German contingent, German-speaking family, uh, my wife's family, and uh, the British-speaking family uh, who could, they couldn't speak to each other, but they could all play Happy Salmon together. So we had twelve-player games of Happy Salmon going on uh, for hours in Germany, uh, and then in Wales we had a lot of just one being played. Timeline was a big hit. Um, I certainly saw a few games of Ticket. To Ride London being played. Um, what else? Uh, there was Strike going on, and um, uh, I saw a little bit of Picoco, um, Ghost Blitz, uh, Dobble, uh, Rock Paper Wizard. These were all popular games at the wedding. Uh, easy to learn, simple games, which is more and more my bag. And as you'll see as we go through this ten, top 10 list, I think I'm uh, moving away from those big strategic games more and more and tending towards that lighter stuff, which means that this top 10 video is not necessarily going to seem similar to all those other top 10 videos that you might see, uh, because I suppose I'm getting less uh, gamery, more casual, more uh, more into that simple stuff. And it's partly because of lack of time. Uh, my other job, my healthcare job, I'm a dentist, My um, uh, that role is building, it gives me less time, I'm, I'm inventing more games, spending more time designing, uh, I'm now married, I, I, I just don't have the time anymore to invest in, in playing these big heavy games. And as a result, it means that I can't honestly say that this list is any sort of authority because I certainly have not played the vast, vast, vast majority. 99% of the games that have come out this year, I haven't played. I haven't played all the big hitters. To be honest, I haven't wanted to. So these are gonna be the 10 picks um, that uh, I've really, really enjoyed. 10 real gaming highlights for me. I'm going to talk a lot about expansions as well. Uh, my wife is very much a gamer who likes to play the same game over and over and over again. And traditionally, I've not tended to do that. I've tended to play lots of different games and play them a few times each. And um, so we've really invested a lot of time into the sort of the top five of this top 10 list. But also I've been out looking for innovation and that's harder and harder to, to find year after year. Um, and so some of these games creep into this list uh, by virtue of their innovation. They're not necessarily a game for everybody, um, but there's something about them that I thought was interesting. Something that subverts the industry in some way or introduces, introduces something new or brings back something old. Um, so that's what we're sort of looking at. Now, in terms of my own personal designs, there have been two of them that have come out this year. One came out very early in the year, and that was my game Throne. Now, Throne is a dice-based trick-taking game uh, that came out in the early part of the year. And um, it came out with very little fanfare. It, uh, it, it had uh, a few positive written reviews before it was released, and then shortly before it was released, it had one very notable negative video review that kind of... Uh, I suspect sealed its fate as being something that was never going to hit the masses is certainly a niche little game, but I, I really like it. Maybe I'd created a game that was just for me. It's got a high degree of chance in it, a high degree of push your luck, which I always really enjoy. But most, I, I just find it intriguing playing something that is clearly a trick-taking game, but works so differently to other trick-taking games. The same as I did with my game Picoco, where we had a trick-taking game where you couldn't see your own cards. Here we had a trick-taking game where you used dice instead of cards. And I learned so many lessons from this release, and I wish I could share them all here, but maybe, maybe this isn't the place. Maybe that's for another video. What I would like to do today is introduce my newest game, which is Quazzle, which is just coming out now. Uh, currently only available from the publisher directly, their Happy Puzzle Company, a, a UK company. 
Um, but it's going to get a broader release and get out into retail, I hope, uh, early 2020. Uh, it'll be launched at the London Toy Fair and the Nuremberg Toy Fair, and then we'll see where we go from there. This is a quick puzzle game. I'll quickly show you how it works. In Quuzzle, each player has a set of nine identical cubes and a tray. Six pattern cards are revealed and players race to place their cubes onto their tray in an attempt to incorporate as many of the patterns as possible. After one minute, players will score one point for each card that they have successfully fulfilled. However, sometimes it's not possible to fulfill all six cards. If a player ever thinks they have achieved the highest score for the round, they may grab the timer and lock in their answer. If they were correct, and at the end of the minute, no player has beaten their score, then they gain one additional point. But if they were wrong, and another player has beaten them, then they lose one point. The player with the most points after five rounds is the winner. The game features advanced cards, which tell you exactly how many cubes you must show of a particular colour, or dictate that you must have an equal number of two different colours, or maybe a different number of two colours. Or maybe they indicate that you must have a particular colour in every row or every column, or just featuring more challenging patterns on the cards. The extreme cards do away with the grids and force you to solve the puzzle within a much more challenging shape. And the game also features a solo mode where you attempt to beat your highest score. So I designed Quuzzle with my uh, co-designer Rob Fisher and you're going to see a few more designs from myself and Rob uh, coming up over the next year or so, uh, hopefully, assuming all goes well. Um, but enough about my stuff and what's going on with me. Let's move on to the expansions, the best expansions of the year. And actually, I found this was a really good year for expansions. Some interesting stuff going on there. Um, uh, let's start with Wingspan. So we had the Wingspan European expansion. Uh, this is the sort of expansion that just adds more cards different types of powers, but no real new rules to learn. The rules are written on the cards. Basically, you just mix them in, carry on playing, nothing new to learn, and it just gives you more variety, more content for the game. And I, I really like that. It, it works really well. The, the powers are fun. Um, if you've played Wingspan a lot, it does refresh it. Um, so, so that's one particular type of expansion. I, I can certainly recommend this one. Um, a similar sort of thing went on with Quacks of Quedlinburg. So Quacks of Quedlinburg was my favourite game of last year. The Herb Witches adds more stuff, uh, more content, more variety, but without really any added complexity or lots of extra rules. Um, I really enjoyed this one as well. Great to mix that in. You can play it with new players. You don't need to drag it all out. Now, the opposite was true of the Bunny Kingdom expansion, Bunny Kingdom Into the Sky. Bunny Kingdom uh, is one of my wife, well, it is my wife's favourite game and, and a game we play really frequently. And yet we very rarely use the expansion just because it adds a lot of complexity. And once you mix it in, it's very hard to take it back out again because there's so many cards. You've got to remember all those rules. You certainly wouldn't want to play this with new players because of that complexity. So really, this is a game, this is an expansion for people who have played Bunny Kingdom to death, you know, and just really need to breathe new life into it. And it does do that but then you can't switch back and forth very easily. So as an expansion, it, it's sort of, I, I struggle with it really. I enjoy it, but I, I really need to be in a bit of a, a Bunny Kingdom rut in order to mix that in. And then it's a bit of a hassle to take it all back out again when I want to play it with somebody else who's not as involved with Bunny Kingdom. Um, similar sort of thing, I would say, for the expansion Pearlbrook for Everdell. Uh, added complexity, added stuff, added length to the game. Um, really good, really fun. We've played a lot of Everdell and I appreciate that extra stuff. Um, but I already think Everdell drags a little bit with, with more players and adding more time, more decisions, more actions that you can take just means a longer play time and more downtime while people think about their turns. So I haven't played the other two expansions that came out this year for Everdell. I'd like to. Um, this is beautiful, high quality, uh, but like Bunny Kingdom Into the Sky, I think it's really for the hardcore Everdell players, not the people who dip in and out. Now, the best expansion of the year, in my view, was for Baron Park. This is Bad News Bears. I actually did a full review of this. This, I think, is one of the best expansions I've ever played. It's actually an expansion that lifted the base game which I always felt was just a little bit lacking. I, I like it, but 
This turns it into a game that I love. This is just brings the game from a little bit too simple to exactly the weight I want it to be. Difficult decisions, uh, but not difficult rules. Uh, you can throw this expansion in and continue to play it with new players. You're not, you're not going to overwhelm them. But actually, it's tough playing with the Bad News Bears expansion. It makes things much more strategic and gamery, much more difficult choices to make. I think this is an excellent expansion. I'd recommend it to anybody who enjoys Bear and Park, or actually for anybody who liked Bear and Park, but thought that it hadn't quite met its potential. I think this is exactly the sort of expansion that lifts the game and turns it into a classic for me. So now we are on to the top 10 of the year. And as I said, I've not played every game that came out this year. Um, and what I'm allowing into this list is basically anything that came out in 2019 or right at the end of 2018. And I didn't get a chance to play it until 2019. So it's a loose 2019 list. And actually the first one on the list is Animo Crazy which is a re-release uh, of a very old game and very old Bruno Feduti game called Democrazy, uh, which is a much better pun than Animocrazy. I feel like by taking away the democracy bit of it and turning it into an anim... I don't know what an animocracy is. Um, so it doesn't quite work as a pun anymore, but still, it's cute. It looks great. And I love Jolly Thinkers games. I've played many... Jo jo In fact, I have. I think I've probably got every Jolly Thinkers release over the years. Um... I really, really enjoy them. I really enjoy the, the quirkiness of them. These are games coming out of Hong Kong. Quite hard to get. I don't know how easy you're going to find it to get Animal Crazy if you don't go to um, Essen Spiel or, or, or live in Hong Kong. In Animo Crazy, players manipulate the rules of the game to put themselves in a position to win. Players collect candy tokens of various colours throughout the game. And the basic rule is that each candy is worth one point, but this changes as the game progresses. Each player has a hand of cards, and on their turn, they reveal one of them. It will have a new rule showing on it, or an instant effect, or an end-game scoring rule. All players use yes or no cards to vote whether the rule is implemented or not, and the majority rules. Then the next player takes their turn. Each player has a once-per-game special card, which can shake things up dramatically. An absolute yes card gets a rule passed regardless of the other votes, and an absolute no card does the opposite. A scam card reverses the decision of the group, whatever that result may be. And when all the candies have been taken by the players, or when the end game card is revealed, then points are totaled and the highest scorer wins. Okay, so Animo Crazy is clearly a silly, chaotic, unfair party game in the mode of something like Flux. Constantly changing rules, people just sticking in a silly rule there just to mess things up for everybody else. Um, you're not going to win this through grand strategy, but, uh, but you're going to interact an awful lot with the other players. Lots and lots of discussion and arguing over what the rules mean and how they're interpreted. And, 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 and it just feels like what it's supposed to be, which is a, a, a group of people who are sort of agreeing on stuff but falling out at the same time, you get rivalries, bitterness. So, it's silly, nonsensical fun. It's quick, it's party-ish, but it, it's, it's more of a, a game, a card game than, than just a, you know, a, a party game like Just One or, or, or Code Names or something like that. Um, I, I think it's wonderful and interesting and odd and clearly not something that's gonna take hold and break through into the market or anything like that. It's an oddity for people who, who don't mind if things are a little bit chaotic and a little bit silly and are actually just interested in a, a unique experience. Also, it plays with up to 10 people, which is pretty rare, uh, and it plays better the more people that you've got. And, and it's all over in like half an hour or so. So, so the next game on the list uh, is Omerta from Helvetique. And I should say at this point, I'm gonna be working with Helvetique on a, on a project. Uh, so I just wanted to say, you know, because. This is the reason that I've ended up playing a murder, right? Because I'm working with the company, I'm looking at their games, investigating their games. I particularly enjoyed this one that was released this year. In a murder, players are gangsters attempting to get rid of their stocks of illegal alcohol before the untouchables arrive to arrest them. Each player has four face down cards in front of them. They look at two of these cards and memorize them. On a player's turn, they draw a card from the deck or from the top of the discard pile, and then they swap it with one of their face-down cards or they throw it away. 
If it's swapped, then the face down card is revealed to all the other players. Now, if it is a bottle card, one player may discard a bottle card of equal value from their face down cards if they have one and if they can remember where it is. But only one player can do this, so the quickest player must do it, and mistakes cause players to draw more cards into their supply. If the newly revealed card is not a bottle card, but a character card, it will have an ability which generally messes up the other player's plans or gives the owner of the cards a benefit. If at the start of your turn you think you have fewer than seven bottles in front of you and you think you have the lowest score, then you call a murder and end the game immediately. All players reveal their cards and score points equal to the value of the bottles in their stock, and the player with the lowest stock gets zero points. If the player who called Omerta does not have fewer than seven bottles, or did not have the lowest stock, then they score all of their stock plus 20 penalty points, and after several rounds the player with the lowest score wins. So like Animocracy, don't expect Omerta to be fair, don't expect it to be strategic, this is random, this is chaotic, this is full of take that, messing with your opponent, loads of interaction, lots of really funny moments as well where you've got that memory element where someone might turn over a card and they've got it wrong, that's always fun, they take a penalty, uh, we've got moments where people turn over a card and then everyone has to react quickly and play another card, that's fun, that's funny. Uh, we get opportunities to, yeah, to mess things up, shuffle up the other player's card, take away their cards, miss a turn. You know, these are stuff that most people would, most gamers, you know, hardcore proper strategy gamers are going to want to avoid that sort of stuff. But for a casual audience, this is really intuitive, simple, fun and funny stuff. Um, I thought it was refreshing, actually, to be able to go back to a, a slightly older era of this more, you know, simple sort of gameplay. Um, with the right crowd, I think it goes over very well. It doesn't outstay its welcome. Um, I like the sort of naive sort of artwork, uh, married with the, the really quite sharp sort of graphic design. The package is nice, you know. And number eight is another game that I would describe as naive in its production. It's set and match, which looks like it's a game released in the 1970s, but it's not. It's brand new. Uh, it's a first game from the publisher. And um, the reason that this one really caught my attention is because a few years ago, before I had any successful sort of release published games, I self-published, uh, you know, just online, print and play, published a couple of sports games. And the first one I did was a tennis game. It was called Advantage Tennis. Um, I've long since made it unavailable because it wasn't very good. Uh, and the reason it wasn't very good was because although it had a clever mechanism that sort of simulated the back and forth of tennis, it was slow and thinky. And that's not what tennis is. And I've since learned uh, while designing games that you can't really replicate a game that's based, uh, uh, something that's based on speed and reaction very effectively in a board game. It's why race games sometimes feel extremely slow. You know, you've got racing cars moving around a track and it's taking forever when, of course, these things should be moving fast. It's why, for me, games heavy on dice-based combat feel a little bit awkward because that's not how combat works. If I'm a, a, a barbarian raging into a dungeon and I, I, I'm swinging my sword and it's all reflexes and action and it's hard to replicate that in a game. And that's true in tennis. Now what set and match does is it actually replicates the speed, accuracy, physical dexterity and skill of tennis. In set and match, players recreate a tennis match by flicking a disc back and forth across the board. To serve, a player flicks from outside of the court, aiming to land in the opponent's opposite service box. A shot is considered in if any part of the ball is in contact with a court line. If any part of the ball is in the ace area, then the player scores a point immediately. If the ball rests in another area and it's in, then we see where the central spot is sitting, and the number advances the player on the track on the board accordingly. If this sort of push and pull of this token results in a player moving the token to the point space, then the player scores a point. There's a bonus of one extra movement on that track if a player shoots from one cross-court zone to the opposite zone. Otherwise, normal tennis rules and scoring apply. And there are rules for singles and double matches as well. I don't know how easy you're going to find it to get hold of a copy of Set and Match, but if you can, I think it's really good for a two-player game. You know, I mean... I've got Crokinole up on the wall behind me, this classic, massive, wooden game. 
and set and match gives you a similar experience in a much more portable, um, uh, humble sort of package. Um, I hope that it gets a little bit more of a release, a little bit wider known. I don't think it's going to set the world alight, but it's well worth looking up if you can get hold of a copy. And number seven on the list is Little Town. Little Town is a game from Yellow, uh, but it's designed by the two designers who made Skylands, which was a game from Queen Games, which went completely under the radar last year um, and has kind of disappeared, really. But for me, it was one of the highlights of the year. Me and my wife played a lot of Skylands. It's still one of our favourite games to pull out. Simple, but loads of variety in that box. And Little Town was... Um, you know, I, I'd heard of it as being something similar, something of a similar sort of weight and level, and it, it, it certainly is. I'm not sure it reaches the heights of Skylands. It's not quite as good as Skylands, but it is a really satisfying package in a small box, beautifully produced by Yellow. In Little Town, each player has a number of workers, depending on the player count, and on their turn, they may place one worker onto the board. The worker activates all eight spaces surrounding them, gathering resources or activating buildings. So forests generate wood, lakes generate fish, mountains generate stone. And buildings often allow you to convert one resource into another or to gain coins or victory points. Alternatively, a player may place their worker into the building space and build one of the available tiles, which are different every game. They must pay the cost shown on the tile and place it onto the board with a house of their colour to show that they own that building. And each building is worth several victory points to them. Now, any player who activates the building in the future must pay the owner one coin to use its ability. Players have a hand of four objectives to complete throughout the game in order to score victory points, and these are revealed as soon as they're completed. At the end of a round, players must feed each of their workers one fish or one wheat, or they lose victory points accordingly. And after four complete rounds, the players count up their points and the highest scorer wins. Okay, so I'm not going to start shouting about the innovation in Little Town. It's, I don't think it's innovative, particularly. It does a lot of things that we've seen before, but does it in a really nice way. It reminds me of a really old game that I've got called Oregon, which was a really good, sort of almost an area control game with tile laying, felt a bit like Carcassonne. Little Town is a similar sort of thing. So this has been going on for decades, but of course now we've got much better production values and what Yellow can do is, is really bring these things to life. So I'm not calling this an innovative package, but I'm saying it's a, a, a beautiful package, which is going to, and the gameplay is fun. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's fine, you know, it's, it's a good, Simple gateway Euro game, really nicely done, really nicely produced. Um, just a slick product. And number six is Silver and Gold. Uh, back in, uh, I think, March or April of this year, I was in Germany um, and I went to a game shop and I found two games that I hadn't heard of. And that never happens to me when I go to a game shop in the UK. So I was really excited because one of them was by Phil Walker Harding and that was Silver and Gold. The other one was by Wolfgang Vorsch and I, and I was excited by that too. And that's coming up later on the list. But Silver and Gold is the first of the roll and write games on this list. So this is where we're, we're writing on the components, uh, in this case, writing on the cards um, and then scoring points. In silver and gold, each player has a dry erase marker and a scoring card, plus two treasure map cards. Four more treasure map cards are placed into a face-up display and each turn, one expedition card is revealed which shows a pattern which players must draw onto one of their two treasure map cards. If they don't want to use the pattern, they may instead cross off one single box on one of their cards. If a player crosses out a cross symbol, they must immediately cross off another single space on one of their cards. If a player crosses out a coin symbol, they cross out a coin on their scoring card. And if a player crosses out a palm tree, they gain one victory point plus one additional victory point per palm tree showing in the central display. If a player completely fills a treasure card, they score it and draw a new card from the display or from the top of the deck. Likewise, if they filled in a complete row of coins, then they score points. After four rounds of seven turns each, then players total their points and some cards will give them bonuses for each other card that they've claimed of a matching colour. The highest scorer wins. 
So I loved the innovation in Silver and Gold. I loved the fact that we took a roll and write game and we moved it onto cards. So each player has a hand of cards and we actually write on the cards with a dry white marker. And then, you know, at the end of the game, you've got to wipe all that stuff off. If you are squeamish about that, your game components, keeping them pristine, don't get this game because your cards are going to end up marked. OK, they're going to end up messy with little dots on them, smudges on them. And you're just going to have to accept that unless you're going to buy a bunch of sleeves and then it's not going to fit in the box. So this is a game for people who don't mind a little bit of scratching up your components and things. And actually, it's really simple to play. Um, there's a lot of luck involved. It's not a deep strategy game, but it's so intuitive um, and really satisfying. Just a really satisfying little portable game. It's nice to have a portable game that isn't just a deck of cards that has something a little bit more tactile going on, the drawing on the cards. It's, this isn't just for gamers, this is for anybody, this game. Um, I love it. I think you could do a lot worse than picking up a copy of Silver and Gold. Now, game number five is a return to form, as if he ever went out of uh, out of form. For Rainer Knizia, this is Babylonia. Babylonia is a return to his old style games, Through the Desert, Samurai, um, uh, Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, Tigris and Euphrates is one of my favourite games of all time, but I really like Through the Desert. I haven't yet tried um, the Blue Orange game, Blue Lagoon, uh, but I gather that's in a similar mode uh, too. Um, Babylonia is a simple rule set, uh, but with lots of really good strategic decisions. It's, it's kind of a classic Nitzia, but it's only just come out. It feels like it could have come out 20 years ago. In Babylonia, players build trade routes between cities and settlements in order to score victory points. And on a player's turn, they have two options. They may play any two tokens, or they may play three or more farmer tokens. If tokens are placed in rivers, then they're placed face down, otherwise they're placed face up. And the board is scattered with these structures called ziggurats. When you place next to these, you score one point, for each ziggurat which has at least one of your tokens next to it. You can place a farmer token onto a crop field, but only if you have a token adjacent to it already. And this will score you the number of points indicated on the crop field, or it will score you a number of points equal to the number of cities which have been claimed by all players. Hexes with icons like these are cities. And if a city has been surrounded, then it is scored, and all tokens connected to that city, which match the icon shown on it, score two points each. A token is considered connected if it forms part of the chain touching that city, no matter the distance. The player who has the majority of tokens around the city claims that city tile, and then all players score one point for each city they now have claimed in front of them. If a ziggurat is surrounded, then the player with the majority of tokens around that ziggurat claim a special power card from the display. And these allow players to break the rules in various different ways for the rest of the game. At the end of a player's turn, they refill their stand back up to five tokens. And the game ends when all of the tokens run out or when all but one cities are claimed. And the highest scorer wins. Babylonia has this... It's a very serious looking game, isn't it? To me, that was almost a turn off, really. I felt like this looked like it could be a, a war game or something very, it looks more complex than it really is. Um, a little bit lighter, a little bit more color, a little bit more, uh, you could make it look a little bit more inviting, I think, but there's no doubt it looks stylish. It's very, very well made. Lots of good choices. Some odd little, um, sort of fringe rules, you know, little rules that it's hard to remember. And so you can easily just miss a rule and, and find that the whole game's slightly off, that everything's slightly unbalanced. So it is one way you have to really get your head around the rule book. It's odd that often when I score, every player around the table scores at the same time, even though it's me that's done something. And that always feels slightly unintuitive in games. But that's not to say it's wrong. It's very, very well balanced. It works very well. It makes a lot of sense but it doesn't necessarily feel right to the players until you kind of get into the swing of it. Um, the game is of a, a shortish duration. Uh, it's, um, it's interactive. There's lots of opportunities to block other people, but it's not mean. Um, 
I don't, again, I don't know how easy this one is to get hold of. I hope that it will become more widely available. I suspect it's not going to reach the heights of his earlier games just because there's so many games uh, sort of coming out every year now. But I suspect if this was released 15, 20 years ago, it would have been one of the mega hits of the year. Um, anyway, I, I would highly recommend it, Babylonia. And if you haven't played those other older games, Tigris and Euphrates and Samurai and Through the Desert, then certainly give those a look too. Number four on the list is going to have a lot of you shouting, this isn't a 2019 game, and it's true, it's not. It came out at the end of 2018, and I only got it right at the end of 2018. Christmas present it was, and I've played it an awful lot throughout 2019, and I think it needed to be mentioned. So this, for most of the year, I would have said that this was my favourite roll and write game of all time. Uh, this is a game where you have sheets of paper and you write on them and you score points accordingly, like fill out your little spreadsheet and then see who did the best. Um, there's not much interaction in it, aside from we're both having the same uh, cards that we've got to work with and then fill out our own individual sort of puzzle sheet. Um, but it's very, very satisfying to do. There's actually a game that I like more, and I can't say that it's replaced it because they feel quite different. Um, but there is a roll and write game that I've enjoyed more this year that's coming up later on the list. But this is Welcome to Your Perfect Home. In Welcome to, players are architects in the 50s, creating housing estates to gain victory points. Each player has their own blank sheet, and each turn, three cards are revealed, and this also exposes the icon on the back of the card at the top of each deck. Each player must then choose one of the paired number and icon combinations and mark it onto their sheet accordingly. Numbers must be placed in ascending order from left to right and can never appear twice, and the chosen icon then has an effect. So you might build a fence to separate off sections of your street. You might increase the value of certain sized sections of street. Or you might build parks or swimming pools, which score in various different ways. You might add or subtract one to the number that you picked. Or you might duplicate a number by adding a little extension adjacent to the house. City plan cards are revealed at the start of the game. And these give you bonuses to work towards. For example, you might want to build sections of set sizes or build parks and pools or extensions. I mean, the theme helps here, the style, the graphic design, the, just the look of it. It's so inviting. It's a, it's a lovely, warm, enjoyable theme. The lack of interaction in it means that it's also not mean in any way. You just get your head down, you do the puzzle. Uh, it's, it's a good, there's a good amount going on. It's not it's not as simple as silver and gold that we've already talked about. There's more going on in this one. And so that means it's, it's a little bit harder to teach than silver and gold and it lasts a little bit longer. But actually, it's, it's got a bit more depth to it and, and, and you can feel like you're, you're getting better at the game. Number three is another one that I've uh, done a video review of this year. And actually, it's one that I mentioned just now that I found in a German shop uh, before I'd ever heard of this game uh, back in April, and that's Taverns of Tiefenthal by Wolfgang Vorsch. What excited me about it was the fact that it it was clearly the same artist as Quacks of Quedlinburg, the same publisher as Quacks of Quedlinburg, and the same designer of Quacks of Quedlinburg. And it's a deck building game with dice drafting. I mean, all of those things together get me excited. In the Taverns of Tiefenthal, each player represents an innkeeper in an oldie worldy German village. They each have a personal player board with reversible tiles, so the inn can be upgraded as the game progresses. And each player also has a small deck of cards which are personal to them. The deck contains all the inn's regular customers and all of the staff. Each inn starts with only three tables, and at the start of each round, all players simultaneously turn over cards from the top of the deck, placing them into their inn until all of the tables are filled with guests. Once this happens, the player must stop revealing cards. And once all the cards have been revealed in all the player's inns, then each player rolls four white dice. These are passed around the table, with each player taking one die at a time in a simple circular draft. If players have revealed waitresses, then they will have additional dice allocated to them, which do not form part of the draft pool. Once players have selected their pool of dice, they're placed onto the guest cards and various areas of the board in order to power various actions, generating beer or money. Now, players can use their beer to attract new customers. 
And sometimes those have an immediate benefit, giving you an additional card or killing off one of your weaker guests. But often, they're simply upgraded versions of your starting guests with more money to spend in your establishment. Players can also spend gold to hire new staff. Alternatively, you can spend gold to upgrade your inn, giving you more tables, more storage to keep gold or beer between rounds, or giving you staff members who are always going to turn up regardless of your card draw. And when you upgrade your inn, you also gain a noble guest card, who's worth lots of victory points at the end of the game. Any newly acquired cards are always placed on top of your personal deck, so they're always available in the very next round. And at the end of each round, players discard all the cards they've placed in that round onto their own personal discard pile, and then the whole sequence begins again. Once a player's personal draw deck is empty, then that player's discard pile is shuffled and it becomes a new deck, so that customers and staff return to the inn round after round. After eight complete rounds, the players count up the victory points shown on all of their cards, and the highest scorer wins. Okay, so Taverns of Tiefenthal, when we first got it, we played it a lot. We played through all those modules. I liked it best once I'd got all those modules up and running, and then the game really had some depth. And then it fell off a little bit for us. We didn't play it as much. It hasn't had the staying power of Quacks of Quedlinburg. It doesn't feel as immediately exciting and different to other games that we've seen before, which is odd because there is a lot of innovation here. I love the, the flipping of the tiles to upgrade your board. Um, the deck building, of course, we've seen before, the dice drafting we've seen before, but putting them together into in this way makes it feel unique. I like the story that comes through of the people visiting your pub over and over and over again and trying to, uh, you know, make your, um, make your clientele better. And, and, and improve your staffing as well and your ability so that you get better, your turns get better and better as you go through. So of the two, Quacks of Quedlinburg is certainly still my favourite, but if you like that game and you're looking for something a little bit more complex but in the same sort of style and the same sort of feel, then Taverns of Tiefenthal is a really good follow-on point. Number two on the list is that roll and write game, the best roll and write game of the year and probably the best roll and write game that I, well, certainly the best roll and write game that I've played so far. And that is Cartographers. Now, Cartographers was, uh, I, I hadn't played any previous game from this system. I hadn't played the game Role Player that I've got behind me here, which is a dice drafting game. The theme turned me off for Role Player. I'd heard it was good. Um, and actually... Cartographers was good enough that I went back and revisited Roleplayer and found just how good it is. In Cartographers, players are creating maps under instruction of the Queen. The player who discovers the most desirable lands and hence gains the most victory points wins. Each player has a blank sheet and a pencil, and four cards are laid out on the table representing special scoring opportunities. So in this example, players are trying to earn eight reputation points for each cluster of six or more village spaces. For this one, they're going to earn six points for each complete row or column they filled out on their grid. Here, they'll score one point for each forest adjacent to the edge of the grid. And here, they'll score points for having water or farms adjacent to mountains. Each turn, one card is revealed, indicating a terrain type and a shape that a player must draw on their map. Often there's a choice to be made. Ruins cards indicate that the shape must be drawn over a ruins icon on your sheet. Monster cards allow you to draw a shape in the most awkward spot on your opponent's sheet. And if you surround a mountain, you gain gold, which gives you points at the end of each round. A round ends when a set total is reached by adding up the numbers at the top of the revealed cards. And at the end of the round, representing a season, the players score points according to two of the scoring cards laid out at the start of the game. In spring, the cards A and B score. In summer, cards B and C score. In autumn, it's C and D. And in winter, D and A score. And players additionally lose points at the end of each round for any monsters that they have on their board which have not been totally surrounded. After four seasons, the players total their victory points and the highest scorer wins. Now you've probably noticed that this is kind of a... If you mixed Welcome To and Silver and Gold together, this is probably what you would get. It is a polyomino game, so we're, we're making these Tetris-style shapes, writing them on the board, a little bit like Silver and Gold, but we've got our own individual sheet, a bit like Welcome To, we've got different um, sort of missions that we're going for, different card bonuses that we're working towards uh, from game to game, a bit like we do in Welcome To. Um, 
the whole thing, the, 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 I like the interaction. There's just that nice level of, you know, taking the other player's sheet and drawing the monsters on it to mess them up a little bit. That happens, you know, maybe, maybe four times in the game. Not necessarily, but maybe four times in the game. It's not enough to make the game feel mean. It's just enough to make it challenging and feel like you're playing together. Um, I really, really like it as a sort of head-to-head two-player game. Um, the, 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 the idea of drawing maps is really, really fun. You know, I keep going back to it. I never get bored. I feel, I find not more depth, but there's enough variety in that package that, um, you know, I find it challenging. I find it interesting. Um, it's just a great puzzle, a great puzzle to sit down and play with other people uh, with just that touch of interaction that the other, the other roll and rights don't seem to have. My number one game of the year is Wingspan uh, by um, Stonemaier Games and Elizabeth Hargraves. In Wingspan, each player starts with some birds and some food. And in this video, I'm using the lovely wooden food tokens I bought separately from Meeple Source. Players are attempting to fill their own personal boards with birds. And on a player's turn, they may place a bird by feeding it with the required food type, and in later spaces by also giving up one or two eggs. And the birds must be placed into their favoured habitats. Or the player may take food by selecting one of the visible dice results and taking a corresponding token. Or a player may lay eggs up to the allowance indicated on each bird card. Or they could draw new cards into their hand. So they have four actions available. And for each action, you get an increased benefit if you have several birds already in that corresponding habitat. Often, when you take an action, the special abilities of the birds on your board will activate, giving you resources or other game-changing effects. After each player has used all their actions, then the round ends and bonuses are scored for certain objectives. For example, having the most birds or having the most eggs in a certain type of nest. And after four rounds, the game ends and players reveal whether they've completed any of their secret objective cards. These points are added to the points shown on the birds and they also gain one point per egg and then the highest scorer wins. There's nothing innovative in this gameplay, but it is slick. It plays so well. Two player, it's so quick. I, as a two player game, oh, this is, this is fantastic. We can get through this in 20 minutes and play it several times in a row. It's beautiful. The cards are just beautiful. The theme is just so well chosen. I mean, I've spoken many times about my favorite theme is evolution. That nature stuff really works for me. Uh, and the watercolors in the artwork make it feel so stylish and, and mature as a game. Um, I, I don't know, it just, it just works for me and clearly works for so many other people as well, this theme, because this game has sold an absolute ton. It's been hard to get most of the year because it just sells out as quickly as it comes in. Uh, is there anything else that I need to tell you? Yes, I know what else I wanted to tell you. Throne. Throne, earlier on this year, came out with WizKids, and I picked up a couple of other WizKids games to look into it. I haven't played that many WizKids games. And the two that I picked up were Rock, Paper, Wizard and Fantasy Realms. And I would say Rock, Paper, Wizard and Fantasy Realms would beat every game on my 2019 list if they'd come out in 2019 or 2018, actually. They're a couple of years old, so I couldn't include them on the list. These are wonderful games. These are two of the best games I've played in years. Um, Rock, Paper, Wizard is extremely chaotic, silly and fun. Uh, it is like Cash and Guns, but I, I never got on much with Cash and Guns. I didn't find it that much fun, whereas Rock, Paper, Wizard pointing fingers at each other and casting spells on each other. It's total take that, total chaotic. And I've had more laughs with this game than any other this year. I, I think it's hilarious. I think it's clever. I think it's, it, it, it's you know, the production is stylish. Um, I really, really enjoy it. And Fantasy Realms is a far more sort of strategic game, but with uh, you know, lots of depth. You can really learn the cards and learn how to play this game. But actually, the rule set is one of the simplest I've ever come across. I mean, this is Sushi Go simple. Um, the art style, uh, I, I don't, you know, the box looks so boring. The, the art itself is fine. The art is actually the same artist as on Throne. But yeah, Rock, Paper, Wizard, Fantasy Realms, real highlights. I wanted to mention them because they've been two of the highlights of the year for me. 
but they're not 2019, they're not even close, so therefore I can't include them on the list. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting, I hope you found it enjoyable. Uh, if you have, please watch some of my other videos, I'm sorry they've been a little bit more sporadic than usual, uh, I've never been particularly regular with these videos, I'll try and make some more soon. Um, but yeah, have a great Christmas, have a great New Year, and I'll see you in 2020.